I have a, uh, a great title slide uh, and a great title. You guys are going to like this one. Uh, the Crazy Yellers. Isn't that good? Isn't, aren't you guys intrigued already? I mean, this has to be good. Uh, so it's interesting because I'm back in the back and I'm even wondering if I should pivot my message. I'm even saying that to God. I'm saying, God, do you want me to give something different this morning? I'll throw this one out. And I remember I was speaking in an environment where I was, it was more of a, an unusual environment for me, where I wasn't used to uh, speaking in that environment. It was a film festival and I, I didn't feel like a filmmaker and I, it was all sorts of filmmakers. In fact, it was the guild side, so it was all the, uh, the filmmakers. You know, It wasn't the people that liked to watch films, it was the filmmakers. And I'm supposed to be speaking in front of them. And I remember Stephen Kendrick got up for the first prayer. And I was the first message that was going to be given uh, at this guild. And he says, I just want all of you speakers, because it was a gathering of all the speakers that are going to be here this week, to just set your messages before God and just ask uh, that if God has something different, that he would have his way. Great. Uh, and so I'm the first speaker and I'm praying. I'm like, oh no, uh, no, God's asking me to do something different. So I crafted this message that would sound smart. It would make me look rather intelligent and sort of artsy and God throws it out. And I have one that makes me look weak, small, shares all sorts of stories about how dumb I am. It was perfect. And God knows how to tailor make even for the messenger the message. And oftentimes the messages that I'm given are the very ones that I need to be reminded of. I need to have invigoration in my own soul for. How this one uh, works towards that, we'll find out. Uh, The crazy yellers. There's a word in scripture that sounds very similar to crazy. It's kradzo in uh, the Greek. I'm still convinced that the etymology of the word crazy, even though I haven't been able to prove it yet, is kradzo. I just have a hunch about that because it's just no, some of the etymology that they come up with crazy, it's like, come on. We have a a Greek word that says kradzo and every time someone's doing it, they look crazy. I just think it is the perfect fit for it. But even if it's not, it's interesting because kradzo means to yell, to shout, uh, and sort of look foolish, if I could add a little uh, caveat to it. And so the crazy yellers, this word is like, it enunciates it in one Greek word. Uh, Kradzo, to croak. Isn't that a great way of saying it? To cry out like a raven. That's an interesting one too. To cry aloud, to speak with a loud voice, to scream, to yell, to exclaim, to shout. John 7, 28. Then Jesus kradzod. It's a crazy word, right? And then Jesus is going to do it. It's like if there was anyone who had the decency uh, to not do something like this, it would be Jesus. But Jesus doesn't just do it. He does it publicly. Then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple. He was teaching. And then suddenly he cried out. He kradzod in the midst of his teaching. John 7, 37, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood in kradzod, looked a little crazy, and yelled out. Acts 2, 14, Peter lifted up his voice. This is the giving of the Holy Spirit. Peter is going to walk in the streets of Jerusalem, the very same city Christ was crucified in. And by the way, crucifixion is a statement to everyone who would watch, saying, you do the same, you get the same treatment. Peter is going to walk out in the midst of that very city that had conspired to crucify his master, the one he follows, and he is going to lift his voice in the midst of that city. Cuckoo. Isaiah 58.1. I thought this sort of summarized it fairly well. Cry aloud, spare not. Now, this is in the Old Testament, so I can't use the word kradzo here. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. No one really wants to be the prophet given that assignment. When we look back at the Old Testament, we can easily just sort of shrug our shoulders and say, well, yeah, they were a special breed. They didn't feel human feelings like we do. They would get an assignment from God and just be like, yes, master. And they would just do it, sort of like robots. Well, I know for one that isn't true, even though I've had the same thought go through my head that they were of a special stuff. 
that maybe they had a greater power than we do. Why is it so hard for us to represent Christ in a fallen world? Why is it difficult for us to see a statement like that and say, well, not me. There is no way I'm doing the crowdzoing in our culture. Not every crazy yeller wants to be a crazy yeller. In fact, I would almost go as far as to say, I don't know that there's anyone in human skin that actually wants the job. And maybe there's some guy that's, you know, that truly is a little cuckoo that wants to do it. He just wants to raise his voice and make noise. You know, there's probably some guy out there that doesn't seem to have the social sensibilities that that isn't a good idea, that he's going to fall on the bad side of popularity ratings. And yet most of us that are sane, you know, grew up well-trained, have a sense of etiquette, we know what not to do. And that is we don't walk down to a street corner and start yelling. I mean, you could even yell some good stuff, but it's still deemed in our culture disrespectful and dishonorable to invade someone's private space with your strong opinion. So we don't do this. This is not appropriate. This is not right. You know how many things in scripture fall into that category where the very thing that we have been trained not to do, Jesus is going to say, yeah, but I'm asking you to do it. I've used the illustration in the past that you go to some dinner party and some guy's in the corner with his arms folded. That's a statement. And that means leave me alone. I don't want to engage in uh, any conversation. Just leave me be. And for all practical purposes, we want to leave that guy alone. If he doesn't want to talk, well, I'm not going to be awkward, you know, to walk up and say, hi, do you want to talk? No, I don't want to talk. I'm not going to be the guy that does that. But ironically, the spirit of God will override social norms, social construct, and say, talk to that man. What? I don't know how many of you have been in those situations, but they're not that easy. It is actually rather difficult to do that which we are called to do by God in a culture where it is deemed eh, wrong. And yet that is the essence of Christianity. You, by the way, I'm going to give you a, a quick definition of Christianity, are being commissioned to violate social norms to represent your king. Almost every single thing Jesus is going to do is going to violate the social norms of his day. And so we oftentimes think that we're an exception, like the American culture somehow is like different and you're not supposed to violate that one. That's the right culture. And, you know, you sort of heed its norms when in actuality, God has commissioned each one of us to represent him. And when we do, it gets translated as a little crazzo, a little crazy. So the reason I say that not every crazy yeller wants to be a crazy yeller, listen to this. John 1, Jesus did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. That statement stood out to me this week. I'm going to read it again. Jesus did not want to walk in Judea. You know these stories that I was just telling you about him kradzoing? Yeah, that's in Judea. He didn't want to walk in Judea, and he had a pretty good reason. Uh, because the Jews sought to kill him. You know, I, that's a good enough reason for me. How about they'll make fun of me? How about I may lose my job? How about I, I may look funny to the world? I mean, there's all sorts of reasons we could come up with of why we don't want to walk in Judea either. And yet there is a commission in our lives to go to Judea. That's actually the whole point of this story is that even though he doesn't want to, and I, this is a, a tough one because you could translate this multiple ways. One is that he chose not to because he's God and he knows he's not supposed to because there is uh, an attempt on his life here. And yet there's also the translation which is on the screen right now. He didn't want to go. And is it possible that the humanity of Jesus is like, no, I don't want to go there. If they're trying to kill me, no, no, thank you. I don't know. That's, that's up for debate. Uh, and I, I would say that one thing we know is that Jesus was without sin. So whatever is going on, it's not fear. It's not trepidation. It's not disobedience. But it seems to really be a defined statement of his liking in the situation. He doesn't want to go. 
So I have some background in crazy yelling. And some of you have been around long enough to know that uh, Eric actually in the past has had even greater volume swells than I do now. And I, I can't even explain that. It's not like I can say, oh, here's what was going on. I thought that was a really cool way to communicate. There was a certain point in time when I yielded to God and I said, God, you have my tongue. See, I used to teach professional communications to professionals, like even politicians. It's, what I, it's one of the things I did is I taught people how to communicate, how to win an audience, how to lead an audience. So if there's one thing I know, it's that yelling is not actually the most effective way to cause your audience to rest. You see, there's different ways that we communicate that are a service unto our audience. I gave the illustration to someone the other day that when you're in your kitchen at home and you're talking with your family, if you could take you in that kitchen mode and put it up onto a stage, that's what your audience actually wants because they can relax if you're relaxed. Most people, when they get up in front, stiffen up and they have their notes and their hand is shaking and it causes us as the audience to get stiff too. Not that we are not empathizing, not that we don't care about the person speaking. It's just that it's a labor that we enter into. And I, I still remember this one lady coming out to sing the national anthem uh, at a Nuggets game. This is years ago. And she started too high. And the whole time I was stressed. And she got to the, the point where she couldn't hit the note and she stopped singing. And it was, it was, there was no musical backing. So it was just, she stopped. And it's in a dark arena with a spotlight on her. And she stops and I am stressed out. I'm not the one singing, but I'm stressed out. And then she starts again at a, too low and she can't remember the words. I mean, the poor thing. Every, but when she got done with this, the most terrible rendition of the Star Spangled Banner uh, you've ever heard, it was the biggest applause I've ever heard. And it's our instinct as humans is to support those that are in the spotlight that are stiff. And so the way that we can serve our audience is by relaxing, right? And there's certain techniques that you can use with your audience that cause them to feel known and understood and cared for. And there's language that's inclusive, like we are struggling with this as opposed to you are struggling with this. No, 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 don't ever do the you thing, it's we. And there are techniques that you can utilize as a communicator which cause your audience to feel cared for, to feel loved. And ironically on that short list, yelling is not one of them. And so when Eric, back in the day, says, God, I am really scared that you're going to make me a John the Baptist who's crying aloud in the wilderness. <sighs> but here I am. It's not for me to define how you use my voice. It's for you to define. And God is going to, in this certain moment, and some of you have heard the story when uh, Leslie and I were in, we called it our upper room. Uh, it's now Mike and Krista's house, but it's, it was our studio where we wrote our books and we'd prayed every day. And we were praying and I had my eyes closed and suddenly Leslie puts her hand on my shoulder and I stopped. And uh, she prayed a prayer, Lord, make my man to pray like a man. And I remember thinking, what in the world does she think I pray like? There's not that many options. And so, but I decided to agree with that prayer. And, oh, I don't know how many seconds, 15 seconds, 30 seconds after that prayer, something changed inside of me that has never left. And I've always called it the growl. There was like a lava, uh, the rise of lava in my soul. And my prayer that came out after that had force, had strength, had authority. And it's almost like my hair went back, even as I was doing it, it's like, whoa. And the next time I got up to teach, when I spoke, it came out forcibly. It came out strongly. 
And any of you that know me know that I'm a golden retriever sort of character. I'm not like, you know, one of these mean uh, dog types. I'm a, I'm a nice dog, wag the tail type of dog, right? And yet people didn't quite know what was going on inside of Eric because my voice was so loud. And I mean, if you, you ever want to hear an old sampling, just go to the video, uh, Ancient War Cry. The way that that crazy video got edited, it starts with me in the full volume mode. Something like, where's our war cry? You know, and it scares me. And yet, I understand. I had people that would call me a yeller. That's what they called me. Oh, you're a yeller. I didn't know that that was even a type of communicator that existed. It may not have been, and then I became the certain one. They had to, you know, denominationalize me sometime. Oh, we got the, you know, the soft teacher over here, and then we got the yeller over here. Well, I don't want to be a yeller probably any more than you do. The inciting incident in today's story. So every good movie has to start with an incident that sort of starts the dominoes falling. And so for our story, which is in John chapter 7, we have to go back to John chapter 5. John 5, 5 through 9. Now a certain man was there, this is at the pool of Bethesda, who had an infirmity 38 years When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up and while I'm coming another steps down before me. So what it says in scripture, which is hard for us to know exactly how to relate to is that whether it was legend or whatever, an angel would come down, stir the waters, and anyone who got into the pool of Bethesda could be healed. Or maybe it was the first person in. I mean, but it's a little odd to all of us, we have to admit, right? Well, this guy can't get to the pool. And so he doesn't have someone to carry him. So after all these years, 38 years, I don't know if he'd been at the pool side 38 years, but it's a long time that he is still a cripple. And there's nothing he seems to be able to do about it. Jesus comes to him and says, do you want to be made well? Now this, in the past couple of weeks, this entire story has had a deep impact upon me because there are certain impediments that all of us have that sometimes are under the surface. They're not like public uh, problems that we, we struggle with. They're, they're more on the private side, whether it's like things that could be very smallish, don't even, not even worth mentioning right? If you're around other people, it's like, I'm not going to bring that up that I struggle with irritation. And yet those sorts of things can be like a paralysis that we can carry around. Like one leg just sort of drags uh, through our spiritual life. Oh, we could still walk, not totally normally, but hey, it's not that bad. And then Jesus comes and says, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. That's almost the equivalent of an answer of, I've tried. I've done everything I know to do to get past this. Isn't that a funny answer to Jesus? It's like the very one standing in front of us is actually the solution. Do you want what I have to give to you? But I've tried everything I can do for myself. And I can't seem to make it work. But in that, Jesus somehow hears him say, yes, I want to be healed. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. Now, this is our inciting incident. To us, it's just another healing. But there's something very, very special and souped up about this healing. And that is it's done on a Sabbath day. Jesus, don't you get the thought that he does things that he does very purposely and that he is going to show up? He's like, oh, Sabbath. Hmm, this would be a good day for it. And he is going to heal this man. But first of all, before I move on, I want you to enter this story and be this man. And I want you to hear the commission to your soul. Rise. The translation is get up. Isn't that good? It's like something a mom would say to a child when they're sleeping. Wake up. That's what it means. Wake up. Get up. Rise. Take up your mat and walk. 
that for whatever it is that is impeding our forward movement, I don't want to move past this story and have you not hear it. This is just as much for us as it was for that man with a, that, who was a cripple all those years back. Get up! Rise! Wake up from your stupor. This isn't dependent on you and your strength and your resolve. It's dependent upon him. He has given you everything you need to rise up right now and start moving forward with your life. Stop bemoaning your challenges. You have a savior. So the consequence of love, what is Jesus doing in this situation? He's expressing the invisible realm, the kingdom of heaven here on this earth. The invisible realm is a realm of love. And when Jesus embodies that, what will he do for a man who has been crippled for 38 years? He will heal him. Uh, but Jesus, it's on a Sabbath day. He says, that's what the Sabbath is for. It's a day to express life, love, wholeness, and health. So Jesus, who invented the Sabbath to start with, ironically, is coming into a very human realm that has their way of doing things. And he is going to poke it in the eye. See, there's consequences of love. When you love in this world, you get treated the same way Jesus was treated. John 5, 16, for this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. He makes a crippled man whole on the Sabbath and he's persecuted and they desire to kill him. Isn't that amazing? So the big event. Now, when we read through John, we have a tendency to just read a chapter or part of a chapter and meditate upon, hmm, interesting. But it's all part of a series of events. And this is taking place, which is going to trigger the assassination plot and conspiracy against Jesus, which ultimately is going to be fulfilled at the cross. And so all of this is actually very, very significant in the flows. But in the midst of it, there's going to be a big event. And uh, it's called the Feast of Tabernacles. In the Jewish culture, there are three big events every year, sacred feasts. Now, most of us are generally familiar with those three. Feast of Tabernacles, not so much. Like Feast of Passover, of Pentecost, and of Tabernacles. Yeah, you know, Passover, that's when Jesus died. Pentecost, oh, that's when the Holy Spirit was poured out. Tabernacles, what in the world is that? And so most of us are not greatly familiar with that, but this is the event. So he's going to heal this paralytic before that, and then we're going to run you know, smack into this event. You could say, well, what does that have to do with it? Well, just follow me. This is, it has a lot to do with it. John 7, 2, now the Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. What is the Feast of Tabernacles? Well, I'll, I'll just give you at least a quick overview. This isn't a deep dive. This is a quick overview. It could also be called the Feast of Booths. That doesn't really help us, does it? Tabernacle is not a word we use. Booths is definitely not a word that we use. But it's like a house. It's a dwelling. It's a place you live. So it's a feast of houses? Yeah, but these aren't just normal houses. So you could call it the Feast of Little Leafy Homes. And that would make a lot more sense to a Jew than it would to us. You see, what they were commissioned to do was to actually build homes, cut down branches of trees, and build leafy huts, and live in them for eight days. Okay, that's a little odd. But it was symbolic to remind them of their time in the wilderness, and to remind them of the tabernacle in the witness in the wilderness. But it's also, if you put on your Jesus glasses, it's to remind us of the coming kingdom, that Jesus is going to become, I know, this sounds a little strange, a green leafy home for us to live in. What is a branch? It's something that is cut off and dies. Jesus is called the branch. And what is he going to do? He is like the rod in the wilderness, he is going to, which is a branch that was cut off of an almond tree, going to come back to life, bear fruit overnight. And he's going to become our dwelling place. And we are going to live in that tabernacle known as Jesus Christ. That booth. I know whoever thought of calling uh, Jesus bo a booth. 
or that green leafy hut. You see, he's a house, he's a dwelling place, and that's what this is symbolizing. Leviticus 23, 39 through 44. So this is Moses speaking, which is why you see quotations on it. Also, on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day, there shall be a Sabbath rest, and on the eighth day, a Sabbath rest. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moses declared to the children of Israel the feasts of the Lord. And then in Nehemiah, see, they're going to fall into disrepair. The the nation of Israel isn't going to do so hot. Uh, I think some people have called it the cycle of apostasy. They get their game on and then fall to pieces and fall away from God. And then God convicts them afresh. They have a revival in the land and then they remember again. Okay, so Nehemiah represents a remembrance time. And so I'll read this for you really quick. And they found written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses that the children of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month and that they should announce and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem saying, go out to the mountain and bring olive branches, branches of oil trees, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of leafy trees to make booths as it is written. Then the people went out and brought them and made themselves booths, each one on the roof of his house or in their courtyards or the courtyards of the house of God and in the open square of the water gate and in the open square of the gate of Ephraim. So the whole assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and sat under the booths. For since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until the day the children of Israel had, until that day, the children of Israel had not done so. And there was very great gladness. Also day by day from the first day until the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a sacred assembly according to the prescribed manner. Now, this is all a foreshadow for what's going to happen in John chapter seven, because in John chapter seven, this feast is going to come around in the calendar. The zinger. John 7, 1 through 5. So we're going to start out with our story. You already have the backstory now. You know that he healed a man on the Sabbath. You know that the Jews are uh, conspiring to kill him. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, depart from here and go into Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Then it's going to add this comment. For even his brothers did not believe in him. It's interesting because if you just read their quote, you might think they believe in him. But there's something about what they're saying that is going to expose the fact that they don't believe in Jesus. And I I think it's well put by Matthew Henry. It was a piece of presumption for them to prescribe to Christ and to teach him what measures to take. It was a sign that they did not believe him able to guide them when they did not think him sufficient to guide himself. And of course, there's probably a lot more dimension to that. But long and short, his brothers are saying, go into Judea. Now, there's a reason for that, too. You see, there, the feast is at hand. Go in and show yourself. If you don't hide in secret and do your miracles in secret, go do them publicly. Because every man in Israel is suddenly gathering in Jerusalem right now. What a great opportunity if you really are the Messiah. The sticky matter. So we're going to read a scripture from Deuteronomy 16, which gives us a little backstory on what would be happening in this moment. Three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, which he chose Jerusalem, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. 
So it is required, according to the law of God, that every man go to Jerusalem for these three feasts. Well, Jesus is a man. Under the law, which he is a perfect fulfillment of, what is he supposed to do in this situation? He's supposed to go to Jerusalem, which is in Judea. Isn't that a bit of a sticky situation? He doesn't want to go to Judea. But there's a feast in Judea, in Jerusalem. And he is the fulfillment of the law. When obedience means walking into the jowls of danger. So he didn't want to go where they wanted to kill him. That's one statement that we're going to see right in the very beginning of John chapter 7. And we could call that the human side of Jesus. And we could say that Jesus... Yeah, why would I want to go where they want to kill me? That would be dumb. He didn't want to go on the terms his brothers set out for him. What were his brothers' terms? For his exaltation, his glory, to be crowned king by the people. The people are looking for their Messiah. And they're saying, if you really are that Messiah, you go, demonstrate your power, let them crown you king. But they didn't believe in him. They didn't think he was the Messiah. He knew his time for exaltation was not yet here. This was his time for sacrifice. He would fulfill the law, but not as men defined it, but as God did. He would go up to Jerusalem. The pattern for the apostles. So Jesus in this situation, in this story, is actually going to show a pattern that even his followers are going to see and respond to. With the Pharisees desiring to kill them, so the apostles, they desired to kill the apostles too. And on the feast of Pentecost, the apostles boldly enter Jerusalem. Remember, all the men need to come up for this feast too. And they're going to boldly enter Jerusalem as men and proclaim the fulfillment of everything Jesus promised. They're going to do the same thing Jesus does in this story. They are going to show up in Jerusalem and they're going to proclaim everything Jesus proclaimed. Jesus did not want to go up to Jerusalem. I know it's a very odd statement. Then Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come. This is what he's going to say to his brothers. But your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to this feast. For my time has not yet fully come. When he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. So, Here's, I'm going to sort of build a, a understanding for all of us that there is a commission. It's not just Jesus that has a commission when he's here, and it's also not just his apostles. It's all of us that believe in the words of Jesus and the teachings of those apostles. We have a pattern that has been set, and that is that we are commissioned to go into what we could call the jowls of danger. We are commissioned to go even into a place that they are desirous to harm us, to hinder us, to harass us. I, I'm like you. I don't want to go into that place. And yet, according to this pattern as set forth by Christ, even though he didn't want to go, and we could call that his humanity, there is a commission on his life. But he doesn't go according to man's terms. He does only that which the Father is leading him to do. He is going to go up to Jerusalem, but not for the reason his brothers set out, nor in the timing his brothers set out. He is going to obey God in his mission. Jesus does go up, but it says that he goes up secretly. John 7, 10 through 13, but when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said, he is good. Others said, no, on the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. So Jesus does go up. That's something I'm going to emphasize here. He doesn't want to go to Judea, but he does go to Judea. And he goes up secretly on God's terms but then he goes to teach in the temple. Now, here's my, my thought. It's like, okay, Jesus, if we were going to do this secretly, we wouldn't go to the temple and start teaching. John 7, 14 through 16. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled saying, 
How does this man know letters, having never studied? Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. Oh, oh, Jesus. Now, if you really wanted to do this secretly, you wouldn't be in the temple right now. And if you're going to do it in the temple and you don't really want to be killed, you don't say a line like that, which is basically acknowledging in every regard, he is going to make it clear. Look, I'm sent from heaven. I'm the son of God. And everything I'm teaching is not mine. It's actually the father's doctrine. Oh, and it's not going to go over well, guys. I mean, he could have thought this through. Jesus does go up, but then does some crazy yelling in the temple. So in the midst of his teaching, right? It's already bad enough because he's declaring himself the son of God which gets him in trouble and the Jews call it blasphemy and they have to kill him for that too, right? But then he raises his voice. He does that kradzo thing. You know, the crazy yelling? Yeah, in the midst of the temple, he's going to do that. Then Jesus cried out. See, there it is, crazy yelling. As he taught in the temple saying, you both know me and you know where I am from and I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true whom you do not know, but I know him for I am from him and he sent me. Therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him. Listen to this, because his hour had not yet come. You know, that's a very interesting line that most of us don't know how to appropriate in our own life. First of all, some of you are still back in Galilee with all sort of a pile of excuses going, well, no, I mean, they want to kill me there. They're going to mock me there. I could be in big trouble if I go there. We're struggling just to start out, even though the grand commission that we have received is to go into all the world, not into just Galilee, the easy spot where, you know, no one's plotting to kill you. Our job is to carry Jesus into a lost and dying world. Jesus is going to do this, and I'm going to say it this way, in the Father's way and in the Father's timing. And this statement over and over again, and I've taught entire messages on the hour, but the, his hour had not yet come. If he walks in stride with the Father, doing it the Father's way, even if the father leads him to Jerusalem, which by the way, on the human side, he may not have you know, had total comfort with, but he's walking in stride with the father. And if he walks in stride with the father, then he can trust the hour of the father. And his hour is not yet here. And so he is going to be preserved just like all of us. Our job is to walk in stride with the father. Our, wa- our job is to do what he asks us to do, even if it goes against our humanity. Walking in the hour of Christ. So Christ had an hour, and I would just sort of look at it that we have an hour too. That technically the enemy can't stop the life of Eric Ludi. He can't. He can conspire ways to hinder, to distract, to disrupt, but he can't stop my commission. I have a job to do here. And as I walk in stride with the living God, I'm preserved for that purpose. Even in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is hostile to Eric Ludi. But even Jerusalem can't stop the work of Christ in me. Oh, I could agree with the enemy and I could stay in Galilee and hinder the work. The enemy will conspire all sorts of ways to get me to shut up to persuade me that it's not worth it. However, when I yield to my God and I walk in stride with him, the enemy actually can't stop it. So walking in the hour of Christ, our direction, our timing, our steps are not our own, but he who sends us. So our direction, we don't decide it. Our timing, that's, a God, that's God's business. Our steps, those are God's. Now, most of us are not living vibrantly in that reality. If you were to think about how you wake up in the morning, you wake up and you define what you want to do today. And yet technically Christianity is what he wants you to do today. Christianity is what he wants you to speak today. He is set before you in this very day works that he desires, his Holy Spirit is desiring to work through you. If there are people along your path today that he has assigned you to give the love of Christ to. There, there is an 
an, a destination even today that would showcase the glory of God in and through your life. And when you walk in agreement with that, great things happen. Jesus does go up, but stands up amidst the congregation and does some crazy yelling. Okay, if you thought him teaching in the temple was bad, now he's in the midst of the great celebration. It's the eighth and final day, and it's a big deal. It's like all of Israel is there. And he is going to stand up in the midst of that and not just go, hey, people, I just want you to know uh, that I love you. No, he's going to stand up and yell. You know, the kradzo type of yelling? Yeah, that's what he's going to do. John 7, 37 through 39. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture is said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. The craziness of Kradzo. Everything about this, Jesus doesn't want to go to Judea because they want to kill him. But he does go to Judea. He does it secretly. Okay, that makes sense to us. But then he gets up in the temple and starts crazy yelling. Ah! Bad idea, Jesus. If we were trying to avoid the whole assassination plot thing, this was a wrong thought. Then he goes in front of everyone on the great day when everyone is gathered and in the midst and probably the most significant moment when the, the priest is pouring, they, they had two runnels that would come down into a, into a bowl where they would pour water and they would pour uh, wine, I, th I think it was. And it would come down and it would mix. And what that would be is that wine is symbolic of life. It's the blood of a grape. And then this water mixed with that life, the life of the grape, the life, the blood in our bodies is considered life to the Jew. And so the blood of the grape, the life, the symbol, symbol of blood mixing together, that's living water. And he gets up at this moment and starts howling at the top of his voice basically saying anyone that believes on me out of their innermost man will flow living water. It's an incredible statement. Think about the cross. When that spear goes into his side, what comes gushing out of him, out of his innermost man? Living water, blood and water. And anyone who believes in him, the same is going to be true. What is, how are we supposed to appropriate that? What does that mean? It's talking about the Holy Spirit the very life of God, anyone who believes in me, I will give you my life and he will dwell in you and out of your life will flow my life. There's a good enunciation of it. So much for secrecy. It's interesting because all throughout history, there's been something known as the underground church. And when persecution begins to rise, the church has to get smart. And the church has to think, it has to reason through things, it has to create codes. In fact, that was what the ancient fish was. It was a code, a marking to say, yes, I'm one of you. And now we wear it on our cars or you know, things like that. Wear it, I don't know if wearing is the way to describe putting a, a, something on your car. But we'll boldly say it, why? Because we live in America. But if America was under persecution, I don't think you wanna have a fish on the back of your car, do you? Maybe. I mean, that's part of the challenge we face is you see that Jesus here is going to model the church of Jesus Christ. It's the body of Christ. I mean, truly in living color. And though it is dangerous in Judea, the commission that he has received to fulfill all righteousness is to actually go there into the danger spot. And when he does, he is equipped and enabled with something. Living water is inside of him. And every time he opens his mouth, out comes that truth, out comes that life, out comes that love. And they can't touch him. They can't seem to grip him. He has a commission that is unstoppable. And the same is true for us as the body of Christ. Yes, I, I get it. Jesus was apprehended and he did fall into the hands of sinners. However, they didn't take him. It says he gave himself. And the same thing is true for us. Our job is not to preserve our own skin. Our job is to obey God. 
And as we obey God, there comes a time in the fullness of time when it might be right for us to be apprehended. It might be right for us to be put in prison. It might be right for us to suffer uh, for righteousness. And that is just as true as them not being able to put their hands on us. But so much for secrecy. What's the good of an underground church if you're going to go to a street corner and start bellowing at the top of your lungs? And yet, God has called us to be wise And I think John chapter seven, verse one, when it says that Jesus didn't go up to Judea because they planned to kill him, makes total sense to me. At the same time, when the father moved him to go to Judea and to go to Jerusalem and to bellow out, makes just as much sense to me because it's the mixture of Christianity right there. There's a time when we are silent and there's a time when it's time to open our mouth and speak boldly. And for us, we aren't the ones that define that time. Our job is to submit to our God and allow him to use our tongue, to use our bodies, to use our time, our energies, our resources, the way he sees fit. The progression of Peter. So Peter, who is going to follow this man named Jesus, is going to actually go on a very similar journey that we go on. Okay, you could say human unto divine behavior. Peter thinks he can follow Christ and die alongside him. Have you ever had that in your youthful Christianity? You're like, Jesus, I'm so glad you picked me. That was a very wise decision that you made because I'm the right sort of character. I, like all these other Christians that are floundering and failing and ashamed, I won't be. That's what Peter says. I'll die with you. And Jesus has to look him back in the face and say, buddy, You'll deny me three times before the cock crows. And that very night, Peter is going to fail. You see, in and of ourselves, in and of our own resource, I would say our own pockets. It's like what you have in and of yourselves, you cannot pull this off. You're scared just like any human would be. If they're conspiring to kill you, you're not going to walk straight into that. You're going to cower just like Peter. So he pathetically fails and denies Christ. And yet he's reinstated by Christ. And that's part of the gospels that you're going to see is it's very clear that what Peter did is not his end. You see, it is a beginning point. It's a platform point for all of us to recognize that in and of ourselves, we're like Peter. In and of ourselves, we can mean well, but we need power to live out the Christian life. So he is empowered by Christ. That's Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit is going to come and make his body a green leafy booth. See, Peter makes Jesus his home. And he moves into the green leafy booth known as Jesus. And then at Pentecost, Jesus, his green leafy booth, is going to give him power to become a green leafy booth to become an actual mobile holy of holies in this earth. And that's called the church of Jesus Christ. And so then Peter, the very one who denied Jesus in Jerusalem, is going to enter Jerusalem in the boldness of Christ. This is 50 days later. That's what Pentecost means, 50. 50 days later, the same Peter that thought he was all that, but did not have the the substance to do it in and of himself, is going to, in obedience with the same commission Jesus said, every man must come up. He's in Jerusalem. And yet he needs something. He needs, ironically, the same thing that Jesus required, and that is power. Jesus in his human side was human. He was the son of Mary, but he's also the son of God. And when he leans on the son of God's side, he has everything he needs. But Jesus was tempted in every way we are, yet he handled it correctly. Our challenges were tempted in all the ways and we haven't handled it correctly. But we have access. Rise up, get up, awaken from your slumber. Take up your mat and follow him. Walk. You have what you need. The Holy Spirit It's not just past tense. It's not just someday in the future when you get your act together. It's right now. 
present tense available to us to pick up our mat and walk. Everything that Jesus came to do, he supplied it for us so that we could actually do something that no human would ever do. Every human we know would stay in Galilee. They would not go to Judea, right into Jerusalem, stand in the temple and bellow out like a crazy man. They would not on the eighth day stand up in the midst of the Feast of Tabernacles and start karadzoing. That is not what humans do. However, you have not been called to resource your Christianity from your own pockets. You have been called to come to your Savior and say, I need what you have to give me because I can't do this. Do you want to be made well? Is what Jesus says to the crippled man. Do you want what I came to give you? Do you want the full measure of it? Or do you want to decide how you want to live for me? Would you allow me to decide how you ought to live for me? I want you to rise up and walk. I want you to behave as I created you to behave, but you need to allow me to heal you. You need to allow me to take over your life and empower you to live as only I could make you live. And Peter is going to proclaim Christ before the entire city. Hmm, that sounds familiar. That sounds an awful lot like what Jesus does when he comes to the Feast of Tabernacles. And this is the Feast of Pentecost. And Peter is going to show what a man of God ought to do. He is going to come to Jerusalem and he's going to be ready to allow God to use his tongue to speak, to be a crazy yeller. Now, I, granted, when God gets a hold of your tongue, it does not mean he makes you a crazy yeller. What it shows you is sort of this extremity saying, are you willing? That was my whole thing is I said, God, I do not want to be a crazy yeller. I do, no, no, please. I do not want to be the guy with the hair going wild and the camel skin loincloth who's popping locust and wild honey for lunch. Please, no! And then I had to come to the place where I said, God, it's not my terms. In and of myself, I don't want to go up to Judea. I want to stay in Galilee. But Lord... You purchase this body with your blood. It belongs to you. Here it is. Walking into the jowls of danger. So first we start with the human response, which I have a hunch most of you are at right now. Messages like this just poke. They, they prod into that zone of our life where we have resistance to the grand calling of Jesus Christ. We know it. We don't prefer it. And since we're in America, we don't need to employ it, or do we? You see, if you're not employing it now, you're definitely not going to employ it when persecution rises. This is our opportunity right now to exercise everything that this message is showing. The human response, uh, no thank you. No, I'm going to stay here. The divine call, Eric, would you come up to Jerusalem? And sometimes it might be, would you talk to that person about their soul? Well, I, I was in Starbucks, this is a couple of years ago, and there was this pastor from Greeley that was there in my Starbucks, right? And so he comes to my Starbucks and, and visits, and in the midst of it, in the midst of like the, the work day, you know, everything's milling around, it wasn't like it was some moment where it was just made for it. He stands up and starts shouting, he starts shouting the gospel to everyone. Everyone ignores him. I couldn't ignore him because I'm a fellow pastor. <laughs> so I stood up and I smiled towards him. But I was painfully awkward the whole while because I am thinking this guy, first of all, I know what he looks like because I'm thinking the same thing. He looks like a kook. And so I came up to, it was, it was actually really hard for me to do this, but I came up to him afterwards and I hugged him and I said, thank you for doing that. And the whole while I'm thinking, dear Lord, don't let it rub off on me right now. And I just want to piggyback on what this guy just said. Oh, I'm not inclined to that either. It's a lot easier to raise my voice here than it is right down the road. What does Eric need? I need the Holy Spirit. 
I need something that is not natively here. I need an addition from the heavenly side of things entering into my life. And so do you. Any of us that are trying to live our Christianity out of our own resource are going to fail. You will not be able to produce the fruit of righteousness. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You can't produce the divine version of these. You need a helper to do it. The human response, then the divine call. Eric, would you go to Judea? The divine empowerment. God, I feel a little weak right now, like I can't seem to get my legs to move. God will give you grace to get those legs moving. The divine wisdom. All right, I want you to show up in Jerusalem secretly. All right, I like your thoughts. That's a great idea, God. All right, now that we're here secretly, let's go into the temple and start teaching. Oh, now that we're teaching, we have an audience, let's raise our voice. Ah, everything about this is awkward, but it's the wisdom of God, transcendent throughout the ages. There's all sorts of things Jesus did that are not written down. This is written down. Why? For our benefit, that we would grow, that we would see Christ and at his work, that we would recognize his boldness and his courage that is supernaturally born. The divine daring. All right, God. I'll do this. My mouth belongs to you. I will speak. I don't know if any of you have ever been in those moments. Oh, it's, it's challenging. It really is. But there is a grace. Have you guys ever heard my Bourbon Street story? We're in the midst of Mardi Gras with this, this crew of uh, missionaries, and they have a big cross. And I was hiding over in the shadows. It's like, oh, there's no way I'm going to hang out publicly with those guys. And they were all short. And they couldn't get the cross beam fixed in. So they're looking around like, where's that, you know, Eric guy? And there I am like hiding in the shadows. It's like, hey, hey, Eric, could you come over and help us fix this in? Oh, and I still remember just sticking my hand on it. I felt this wave of humiliation, of awkwardness. Oh, and I got it in and I scrambled back to my shadows. And I was, you know, not too impressed with myself. You know, like some of you are thinking right now, it's like, Eric, that isn't a very good witness. I know. But the human side of me was ruling. I needed something from beyond. So if you feel rather cowardly in this whole escapade, join the club. We're all sort of in the same mix. We have a weakness. It's not just your weakness, it's our weakness. And we all need the same solution. And later that night they were standing there being mocked, ridiculed in the middle of Bourbon Street with their cross. And they wanted to know if I would hold the cross. I still to this day cannot explain to you why my mouth said yes. It just like came out. No, no, I actually don't want to. See, there's a human response that gets overridden when we yield. Yeah, I, I'll do it. Oh, Eric, what are, you, what are you saying? And I start walking towards the cross, feeling the tremor of my soul. When I put my arm around that cross in the middle of Bourbon Street, I was there for around three to four hours, and it still to this day marks three to four hours of the most enjoyable time of my life. I experienced a flood of grace that is hard to describe in a human sense. I laughed out loud the whole time. I loved people. It was sort of like God was working through me in a way that he couldn't work through me as long as I stood in the shadows, as long as I remained in Galilee. But when I came to that Jerusalem, and I grabbed that cross, God worked in me and through me. I was laughing. I still remember this one guy, he, he looked back at me and it was sort of like, who's this idiot? And I smiled at him like, hi. And he, he was like all awkward. So he kept walking, acted like he didn't see me. And then I, I was following him and he turned around about 20 feet later. like, huh. And then I was smiling at him. Uh, and he awkwardly went further down. I kept following him like, I mean, people would curse me, throw beer on me. Oh, I loved it. Why? How? How do you explain that? It's because it wasn't no longer the human side of Eric at work. It was Eric yielded. And when Eric yields, just like when you yield, there is power to do things that in and of your human side, you could never do. The divine working. At our point of human weakness, what do we do? All right, guys, we're all going to encounter this. The next morning after that, 
I woke up and I was like, what in the world did I just do? You know, and if you had said, hey, Eric, let's go back out there. No, oh, no, well, wait a minute. I need to think about this. You see, I default back to my humanity. I default back to my old ways very quickly. I might have the working of grace through me where I boldly speak something and then I go back to cowardly position. You actually have to acclimate your life to live in the dependent zone, to live in the given zone because we have a tendency to go back. So what do we do when that human weakness is exposed? Do we justify our non-action? Oh yeah, the reason I can't do this this time is because of this. You know, I, you know, I'm not really built for this, God. I mean, you know, there's other people that are far better at this evangelism thing. Or do we cry out for the power to go to Jerusalem? Do you want to stay on that mat as a cripple? Jesus says, get up. I'm going to give you everything you need to walk into Jerusalem. The question is, do you want it? Do you want my power? Do you want to be healed? Do you actually want to sit here by the pool of Bethesda and, you know, moan in your self-pity? Or do you want to be a believer? Do you want to be the sort of Christian that changes the world? Your choice. I have it for you. Everything you need to get up right now, take up your mat, and walk into Jerusalem. We're going to finish with this. Acts 4, 23 through 24. This is not just a malady that we have. None of us are naturally inclined to being crazy yellers. We want to be liked. We want to fit in. We actually don't want to stand out in the wrong way. If we're going to stand out, we want to be the popular one. That, okay, that maybe. But not as the kook. Not as the crazy guy. No, none of us are inclined towards that. And yet we have been commissioned to represent Jesus. And it's already prescribed for us that we need to embrace the fact that we will be deemed foolish. Paul uses the Greek word idiotes. I don't know if you can get an English word out of that, idiotes. It's an idiot. Paul says, I embrace this. I know what you think of me. However, I personally know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the words I speak I want them to be his words. The life I live, I want it to be his life. Acts 4, 23 through 24. And being let go, Peter and John went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord. Uh, they're going to be persecuted. They're going to be penalized. If they speak in the name of Jesus, bad things are going to happen to them. <gasps> And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. This is precisely what we need, guys. If I were to ask you if you have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of your life, I know it's sort of a hard question to answer, but you also know when you do because you are able to love people that are very unlovable. You're able to be marked by peace in a situation that should have no peace. You're able to go into Jerusalem and obey God even when your human side is pleading to not go. Because you have something from above that others don't have. If you don't have it, I want you to be the paralytic today or that cripple today that's on that mat and I want you to hear the clear word of heaven spoken to you. Get up, take up your mat, and walk. Jesus is saying, I have everything you need. You want the Holy Spirit? Just ask. I will not slap you on the back of the hand and say, no, not for you. You crave Jesus. Jesus craves you having Jesus more than you crave it. He desires and delights to give you his life. Father, like the early church in Acts in chapter four, we tremble when we hear the threats. But Lord, we cry out to you for boldness, for daring, for courage, for the power to no longer be cripples, but to walk and to stride forward in obedience. Lord Jesus, we ask for the power of the Holy Spirit in the name 
in the authority of Jesus Christ. Amen.